we've all sort of watched C sharp as well as other languages become more functional over time. So how does F sharp, do you think, does it contribute to that overall trajectory of C sharp or does F sharp contribute to the direction of .NET in other ways? So the answer is most definitely yes. For the purposes of making this an entertaining show, I'll be quite radical and say that really F sharp owns the minds of the of the designers of C Sharp. F Sharp owns C Sharp in some way. When you look at the trajectory of C Sharp, so much has been about taking things from the design of F Sharp. And I also look at other programming languages, but the whole direction of movement in C Sharp, ever since C Sharp 1, has been about bringing in these more and more functional style of features in. You can go back to C Sharp 2.0 when I was involved in putting generics into C Sharp, which again was related to this work that was done in this pizza system that was done by Martin Nadersky, who then later went on to do Scala, of course. All these things kind of link up back in the late 90s. Then when you look at C Sharp 3, it was all about putting this sort of functional link features in. I wasn't so involved in that because I was doing the core F Sharp implementation at the same time. Then when you look at C Sharp 5, 6, 7, 8, I mean, pretty much about half the features you can see them working on are all very directly related to try to make an F Sharp programming experience happen in C Sharp. So has F Sharp contributed to the direction of .NET in other ways? Yes. So for example, if you look at this Maui system and the way that user interfaces are being written in the Maui system, it's related to a functional technique called MVU programming. Maui is the new UI programming framework for cross-platform working from Microsoft. And another area is in this task-based programming. So you compare async programming as was present in .NET 1.0 versus async programming that is present in the task-based programming model of .NET. You see a move to much more compositional or in the functional world sort of monadic kind of programming where there's a modality of programming, the task modality, the asynchronous modality. And as you compose things together, you build up larger tasks, you build up larger pieces of that modality. And that was an idea first presented to the designers of .NET in about 2006 as part of F-Sharp. So yes, is the short answer. There's just many, many ways in which the functional point of view on computation is made real in terms of F-Sharp and then gets another version of that made real in terms of C-Sharp. And usually the F-Sharp one comes first and then the C-Sharp one does it slightly differently. Awesome, thanks. So given the advantages you've already mentioned, say, to F-sharp, are there circumstances in which you would still recommend using C-sharp rather than F-sharp? That's a hard question to answer because it's so context-dependent. Without any particular context in mind, F-sharp is a superb programming language to use. Now, but if you have context of a team who have training in C-sharp, then that brings in a completely different set of issues about how to look towards F-sharp adoption. And there may be several advocates of F-sharp, several people who are comfortable with using it in a team, but you have to bring the whole team along. This is absolutely crucial. There is a question of education as well. There are more code samples around in C-sharp for different kinds of things. So the F-sharp programmer typically needs to be a good programmer who can take C-sharp code samples and to change them across to F-sharp. So these things do matter, but also people who are new can also just come in with a clean slate and, and drop right into that paradigm. It's not like you need to be an experienced programmer, but the experienced programmers tend to come to F-Sharp and just find they absolutely fly with the paradigm once they're effectively working in that paradigm anyway. So it does entirely depend on your context, but there are absolutely domains where the F-Sharp style of programming really is very sweet. So for instance, web service implementation using frameworks like Giraffe for F-Sharp is incredibly productive. There's also on the client side, F-Sharp also compiles to JavaScript. That's in a tool chain for F-Sharp called Fable. And so we also seeing a lot of people who actually want to program in their one functional programming language for both front end and back end. F Sharp's a good solution in that kind of setting. Awesome, thank you. And you mentioned that you actually had been thinking about OCaml when you first started working on F Sharp. Are there circumstances today where you'd still recommend using OCaml or some implementation of standard ML rather than using F Sharp? 
It's a good question. I mean, for the vast majority of practical production programming, where you actually need to deploy out into production, f -sharp is an excellent solution today. And I personally wouldn't ever feel the need to go to OCaml or standard ML. OCaml is an incredibly productive programming environment. I haven't used it in a long time. I think it's a fantastic language and a fantastic tool chain and very realistic to use for standalone Linux data processing applications and some web programming. So to answer your question, no, you can just use F-sharp. You don't have to use OCaml or standard ML, but you can use those systems if you want, of course. Awesome, thanks. Looking at some differences between OCaml and F-sharp, one of the things that is missing from F-sharp is they don't have the parameterized modules, uh, something's called functors, like in OCaml land. Why does F-sharp not have this feature? Okay, so there's a number of different answers to that. The first is by far the most important thing in F -sharp is to have a good object programming story. We don't really say that F -sharp is object oriented. It supports object programming, like it supports sequence programming or list programming or programming with asynchronous methods and so on. It's a, it's a modality of programming that has particular kind of ramifications on how you compose things and how you design things. And of course, object programming is very metadata heavy compared to functional programming. So this focus of the component being the library of object programming types, that is what a component is in .NET. And that corresponds to a .NET assembly. It's a point of interoperability with C Sharp. So the notion of component is already, in a sense, occupied in the .NET world. And those components are not parameterized. You can't take a .NET assembly and say, actually, I'm going to change the notion of the string type throughout this assembly and actually use a different string type. They don't take substitutions. They are what they are, and they're built on this very rich library of the .NET framework. It's already got its notion of strings. It's got its notions of date time. It's got thousands and thousands of other constructs, well-designed in this core large framework. And then on top of that, you either build one small script and you can get a huge amount done in one small F sharp script, or you start to build one application, or you build a series of your own private components and then you build your application and then maybe reshare some private components, or you make a library to add to that ecosystem. And in each of those activities that I've described, you've never needed a functor. And so in truth, when we came in what I was calling that very early initiatives about programming languages in .NET, we did look at this issue an awful lot. Like there's this thing called functors. Is it actually useful in practice in the .NET ecosystem? Should we be transferring this into C Sharp? Should we be arguing for its inclusion in the design of .NET? And in truth, we could never make the argument that it was a compelling, necessary, I mean, it's hard to get the words. It's like you have to be so compelling that you couldn't not do it, right? Because people will avoid changing a system like .NET in any way they can. With generics, for example, that was incontrovertible. Everybody knew it had to be done. It was a question of how we were going to do it. But functors are not like that. It's hard to find many actual compelling use cases. And one reason for that is that when you have a component, you don't know how many things to parameterize it by. Do you want to parameterize it by the basic type of strings, by the basic type of date times? There are different implementations of date time. You could do that. But by doing that, you make the component more complex and you've got to make all the choices up front about what you parameterize things by. And that just doesn't fly. It's not a practical thing to make those design judgments as part of the design process. Now, there are some examples where functors are still useful. And so, of course, people who don't have functors and are used to having them will then start to complain about not having them. But that's a very different thing from functors being a necessary part of a system design. There was a belief when they were first designed that they could be at the heart of the software component design process. They were going to be the whole story of components and modularization. And from some mathematical perspective, this is true. The research is really great. They're an amazing feature. And I was very tempted. I tried once to kind of put them into F-sharp, but then I thought, well, like complexity, what are we getting for this complexity? When do we actually need this? And the, the answer is not very often. And so, that's why F Sharp doesn't have functors, because they are not an incontrovertible part of the design space for components in the system. Thanks. Do you have any example of your, like, your favorite thing you've ever seen written in F Sharp? 
Ah, oh, that's a really good question. The paper I mentioned before, the early history of F sharp, has some examples of that. I used to very proactively document things that are being written in F sharp. So I think back to these early blog entries that were written. For instance, seeing a genome viewer implemented in F sharp by someone working at the Joint Genome Institute in America. They at the time were, I think, sequencing 80% of the DNA sequencing that was being done in the world. And they were using this viewer as part of a project to look at Neanderthal DNA and the relationship to Homo sapien DNA. And I remember writing a blog entry on F sharp helps prove we're not Neanderthals. And of course, there's a double meaning to that. <laughs> F sharp is a sign of .NET is not, we're not Neanderthals, so we're kind of modern. And uh, so I really love that particular application of F sharp. And there's another one referenced in the paper, which is an engineering firm in Austria used F sharp as people might be familiar with a system called AutoCAD. There's another system called Rhino, which is used by architects and it's a similar setup to AutoCAD. And you can use F sharp as a scripting language in that context. And this engineering firm used F sharp scripting to program up the components used in the roof of the Louvre Museum in Abu Dhabi. So the Louvre has sort of gone worldwide. It's not just in Paris anymore, but it's also in Abu Dhabi. And it's this iconic new building with all this light coming through from the ceiling. And the roof is one of these geometric computer design things. So computation is an essential part of the building. And the thought that all those components of that building, the design lists themselves were actually generated with F sharp code, that makes me really happy. You know, it makes me happy that, you know, when I'm an old man or my grandchildren will be able to go to Abu Dhabi and visit the Louvre Museum and see the beautiful paintings and then look up at the roof and see the light coming through and know there's a story about their granddad or about all the other people who work on F sharp as well. And yeah, so that's one of my favorite stories. There are many, many other examples of fantastic F sharp coding. I've learned so much by being involved in F sharp. We've seen so many different parts of the computing industry and be able to take the journey. I've learned a huge amount, but I'll leave you with that image of the light and the roof in Abu Dhabi. And that's my favorite. That is a really amazing story. That's very cool. And so looking forward, what do you find most exciting in the future for F sharp? Oh, well, I take a very incremental approach. Each day is about working. How can we make things a bit better? And this went through all the work. You know, I came to .NET and I didn't say .NET's wrong. I said, let's make .NET better. Okay, let's put generics into C Sharp. Okay, let's do the kind of work we need to do to get that in. I focus on that incremental improvement and evolution step by step. So for instance, just putting in string interpolation into F Sharp greatly improves the experience. So there is an element that we have done so much innovation in F-Sharp. F-Sharp still looks like a very modern programming experience, even though it was created 15 years ago. It's one of the reasons why it stayed distance in .NET. But some of what we have to do is to take all the great things we've learned from other programming languages and actually bring them into F-Sharp. And those are often more like productivity features that are more targeted and a little bit less about functional programming, but fit very well with the functional paradigm. So string interpolation is a great example of that. We've got a whole bunch of work. The prototypes are all done, for instance, to support this task-based programming natively inside the F-Sharp system. It's a very exciting feature because we get high-performance compilation of these expressive compositional components. So we have tasks, we have task sequences, parts of combinators and the like. We get these state machine compilations of these components which is actually really a bit of a technical nirvana for functional programming languages. To get the functional compositionality and expressivity, but to get the performance of state machine compiled code for these compositional constructs. So that's something I'll be working on. I am also working on some modifications to F-sharp type inference, backwards compatible and everything. As I said, some of my work is in AI programming. So there are some for example, 64-bit integers are totally the norm in AI programming now. And interestingly, 64-bit integers and 32-bit floats the other way around to the default decisions of F-sharp and C-sharp. So we need to improve some elements of type inference to make those choices be a little bit more invisible. F-sharp's story on Linux now is absolutely fantastic. I use F-sharp on Linux every single day. So there's a process that we're continuing to roll that out and continuing to educate people that how strong F-sharp is as a Linux programming language. And also there's a whole lot of work being done in .NET because we're so aligned with the way .NET is delivered now, then everything that's being done in .NET is automatically benefiting F-sharp as well. 
I think .NET is in excellent shape. This .NET Core initiative has really designed the whole of .NET very, very well. So I think we'll see .NET flow to more and more practical programming situations. Many of those will be cloud programming, Spark or Azure Functions or AWS Lambda. So one of the things a mature programming language needs is to sort of just be everywhere. That's what Python achieves. And .NET is beginning to kind of get that feel. It's so readily available through the packaging systems. Sort of looking forward to F-sharp flowing into more places because .NET flows into more places as well. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. It's been a lot of great things we're able to hear from you today. Uh, it's a pleasure, Thomas. I really enjoyed doing this interview with you. And I'll look forward to catching up on some of the episodes that you've got planned. Awesome. Thank you much for your time today. All right. Thanks, Thomas. Bye-bye.